Welcome to the official Colts podcast. My name's Jeffrey Gorman, joined week in and week out by J.J. Stankovic. No Lara Overton today, J.J., so I'm going to be peppering you with a lot. Bring it on. We okay. got uh, Lara, Lara's at a, a luncheon with Kenny Moore and oh, Earl nice. Stewart, I believe, right now. So okay, fair enough. She'll be back in the pod next week for she our, will, our but loyal listeners and viewers. J.J., it's time for you to bring us through this. Let's start with the Buffalo Bills. They came into town. Josh Allen played his worst game this season. As a quarterback, there were a few bright spots on, the, uh, on there, but oh, over the game, uh, rather. But I need to bring these out. There are some deficiencies going on with an 0-3 start like this. Buffalo Bills Mafia comes in. They're louder than, than you know what mm-hmm. at the stadium. We did hear hear them uh Colts had their opportunity some great plays they you know starting out the ball game with an interception your first offensive yeah, play six, JJ yeah, yeah. uh just a tough way to go the Colts gave it a run came back and you know made a push but just fell short at the end what's your once over right now with it, that being the third consecutive loss for the Colts yeah I, I think this one being the the loss that was probably I mean and not just probably it was the loss that was the you were the farthest away from winning over the last couple of weeks where I know that the final score is 30 to 20 that last touchdown, you know, it, yep. it, you're talking garbage time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he threw it to Alec Pierce with two seconds to go, and you know, good for Alec for making that play. But you're that, really that in my mind, that game was 30 to 13. Sure. Uh, so that that being a 17 point loss, and you haven't lost by more than eight points all season, mm-hmm. uh, it, it feels like this team is going in the wrong direction right now. There's still time to turn it around, and there's a lot of stuff that needs to improve on, which I know we're going to talk about here in sure. your lovely rundown. But, yeah, just coming out of that game, you know, you, you feel like the defense still, like, it, it's weird to say that I thought the defense played pretty well when they gave up 30, um, you know, technically 23 because of the, the pick six. But I, I think the defense is doing some good things. And I think this, this defense has kind of coalesced into a unit that you can absolutely win with and sometimes win because of. But now it's the offense that has to pick it up and be more consistent, avoid the turnovers, and try to figure some solutions out for the, this team that, you're still only one game back of the Broncos for a playoff spot. Right, right. Like I, I know, I know, you know, I said this on a, the pod I did with Bill. Like, I know no one wants to hear that, but you are still right there. You're, you're right there in the AFC playoff race. And if you go on a run, you have a really good shot at not just getting in the dance, but hey, maybe trying to make some noise then. Absolutely, you do. We're going to point that out. There's a lot of good to come from this show. I know that they just dropped three in a row like that, JJ. But I want to start a little bit on Buffalo, and we're going to work our way into the Jets and what the rest of the season is and some deficiencies we need to go over. Let's uh, Not that this is deficient, but let's just get it out there. Right after the, the ball game, the Buffalo Bills, we heard from Kenny Moore. Mm-hmm. Kenny uh, you know, had some things to say in the locker room right there. Shane Steichen talked about it at his press conference. He did have a team meeting, a usual team meeting that they do. That stuff was brought up with the leadership council. What's your first take on it? As a guy yeah. who knows his team better than most, and one of the players saying, hey, we need to be better. He's calling out some teammates. Yeah, I think the thing to the thing that I think about with, with Kenny mm-hmm. coming out and saying that is that he's doing it from a place of he wants this to get better. He's doing it from a place of frustration, certainly with the loss, but genuinely he, he's saying these things because he believes this team can be better. He believes there's more for this team out there. So, and I think that's kind of what we heard from Shane Steichen. That's kind of what we heard from Quentin Nelson yesterday, that a lot of this is about individual preparation. It's about individuals making the the right decisions to prepare for games outside of maybe the structure of the team preparation. Um, I thought Quentin Nelson, that, that was a really good point that he made yesterday, is that as a team, the Colts are preparing well. But he can't, you know, you can't speak for every individual on the team. So you need to maybe get that to be raised to a certain level. But I, it goes back to like, I, are, are players here in Quentin Nelson? By the way, oh, yeah. is that locker room? Players here? are here in Quentin. They're here in Kenny. They're here in Zaire. Sure. You know, th- those guys when they speak, the what they say carries a lot of weight within that locker room. So they're they're hearing it, and I think you know th- these are also things that I'm sure these guys have heard behind closed doors. Mm-hmm. This is not a situation where you had a player spouting off about something that he's never communicated to anyone. I I would, I would go to bat and say he's, you know, these comments that have been made have been communicated, but sometimes you do feel the need to go public with them to drive home the point. Hey, listen, we got to do this. So, you know, respect to those guys, because it's not easy to say that what, what Kenny said, what Z said, what Q have said, it's not easy to say that with like grace and some humility too. So, you know, and I think Shane Steichen handled it pretty well yesterday sure. when, he, when he talked about it. Look, guys are frustrated. Guys want to win. Um, you know, I, I think 
it's all it's all done out of believing there's more for this team. Because the one thing I'll say, in 2022, I didn't hear a lot of that. And I, I don't want to say it's because guys were resigned that year, but I think everyone kind of knew. Like, the, this season's not going the way we want it to. There, there's not a lot... There's not a lot we can do to turn this thing around mm-hmm. in 2022. This year, I think there, there's still that belief that we, this team can turn it around. A lot of football left. A lot yeah. of football left. Mm-hmm. And that's when you kind of hear comments like I this. like that he said it at this time of the year. I think that's going to be putting a little bit of a fire plug under some players, like you said, that are hearing Quentin Nelson in a press conference, that are hearing Kenny Moore after at his locker at a game. I think that does ignite something like that. Whether you're offense or defense, Kenny, Kenny Moore is a leader by... By action, you know mm-hmm. he's. A, you know what I'm saying. He's and got, you're also you're talking about like Kenny is having one of the best seasons sure. on the team. Yeah, Quentin Nelson is having a fantastic season. He should be destined for the Pro Bowl. Zaire Franklin, another guy who looks like he's having another Pro Bowl caliber season. So you're having your best players and your best leaders come out and make these statements that should carry weight within the locker room. And we're going to see it. Hey, a lot of football left. Three and five last year through eight. Four and six this year through ten. You saw the run that Gardner Minshew had last year and something like that. And I know Shane Steichen thinks that they can turn it around. Let's go to tough love, man. I'm going to bring up some glaring deficiencies that are going on right now after a three-game losing streak like this. Find some light in this for me if you can. Explain it if you can. But a lot of people are talking on the sports radio shows. You're driving in, you hear it. You go on the internet, you hear it from the football experts about this team and where they're at. So let's go over some tough love categories right here. Quarterbacks. Quarterbacks turning the ball over consistently in this offense. Whether it's Anthony Richardson, whether it's Joe Flacco, that has to change, JJ. Yeah, I mean, you got eight turnovers in your last three games and your turnover differential right now is even on the season you are top six you're six in the nfl in takeaways Mm -hmm. and i believe you're 30th or 29th in giveaways so what that tells me is that you've got a defense that is is getting the ball for you they are doing what they can i think they got nine fumble recoveries this year like they're getting the ball out they're getting on it they're doing a really nice job on that side of the ball, giving the offense the football back, whether it's after the offense turns it over on a short field, whatever it may be. The offense has got to find a way to stop turning the ball over. And, you know, Shane Steichen said, we preach it all the time, but we got to execute it. That is what this team has to do. Whoever is behind center, you've got to be able to take care of the football. And I think what's, what's surprising for this team is that Earlier in the season, they were doing a decent job of it. You had that game against Green Bay where Richardson threw three picks. One of those was on the last play of the game, so whatever. But outside of that, you know, in the, the what is this, the four games before this losing streak, the Colts only turned it over three times, and it was just one a game. While they took it away over that span, they took it away two, one, two, five times. So you, you were winning in the turnover differential then. You, you were taking care of the football, and that led you to nearly beat the Jaguars and then win some close games. This team has kind of operated in winning close games all year, but you're not going to win close games when you turn it over as much as the Colts have. So whatever the solution is, you have to have to turn that spigot off. Hey, let's go to the elephant in the room. Is that the inconsistency, the carousel, if you will? Anthony Richardson? I don't think so. I don't think you it don't. is. I don't think it is because I think it's every turnover has its own story, and you can't just pin it on – oh, that was a dumb decision by the quarterback, or this guy ran the wrong route, or that guy missed a block. It all kind of works together. Turnovers are kind of those like disastrous things that something catastrophic has to go wrong for it to happen. And sometimes it is on one guy. Like Joe Flacco admitted, the pick six he threw to Taron Johnson was an awful decision. Mm-hmm. That's what he said. Those are his words. The other ones, you know, he probably would have liked to have that one to Alec Pierce back. Sure, right? Little sale, yeah. But the, you know, the, the one on the slip screen, like Shane Steichen notably did not say that was on Joe Flacco. So something else had to happen on that play. Hell of a play that by the kid to, to get in there. That's a great play by that oh, defensive That's lineman. a big man, Absolutely. yeah. Right. Yeah. But, and, and sometimes you, you throw a pick and it's, the other team made a great play. Sometimes you turn the ball over. The other team made a great play. So it, it, not all of these are created equal, but whatever it is, you've got to find a way to do your job and not turn the ball over. That, to me, is the number one thing the Colts have to do on offense going forward. If they can do that, if you get those turnovers down to you know zero or one like you had – in that stretch between week four and week seven. It's not surprising the Colts went three and one in that. Sure. And that strength of schedule coming up, JJ, it's definitely different than the last previous five games of the buzzsaw of some fine football teams. Yeah, I mean, currently the the only team over 500 the Colts face down the stretch is going to be Detroit at home. Boom. That's in a couple of weeks. The the Jets are well under 500. Mm -hmm. The Patriots are under 500. Denver's 500 at five and five. 
And then Tennessee, New York, and Jacksonville, I think all only have two wins, I believe. And, get, and J.J., we're going to get some help from other teams down this way. The Colts can keep winning. They can go. Believe it or not, there is a good playoff push for this team if they just do what is right in front of them, win the games that you should, starting with right. this week in New York. I want to stay with the quarterback position, if you will, because you open up Twitter X or you open up anything on the Internet, they're saying, where's Anthony Richardson? Do you think, Joe, I mean, just a gut, because we we can only go by what Shane tells us, in your gut, is this the way it looks like from here on out with Joe leading this offense through the 17 games? And also, where are we with that AR sort of uh, gadget, five, six plays a game sort of thing, premier athlete? Is that ever going to come to fruition? Yeah, I mean, I can just kind of tell you what Shane Steichen mm-hmm. has told us, which is that Joe Flacco's the quarterback right now. Yeah. And, you know, it, everything is being evaluated throughout the season. But Joe Flacco is the quarterback until Shane says he's not. That's what we heard from him on Sunday. As for that package with Richardson, yeah. Shane got asked about that on Monday, and he said, yeah, it would be nice if we could do that. Now, whatever that means, we'll see going forward. Shane is, of course, never going to give away anything Nothing. scheme-wise. And I think if you can just plant that seed of doubt, you know, hey, we might need to defend this, that, that's a good thing. Um, but we'll see. We'll see where it goes over the, the next couple of weeks and, you know, after the bye week. Um, you know, I, I think one thing that I, I've kind of thought about this season – for a little while now, probably since that, even probably since that week eight loss to Houston, mm-hmm. is that the late buy for this team, I think it is, is a little bit tough. If you had that buy closer to the middle of the season. My, my, yeah, that, I agree. You, th- th- this team needs a, a lot to work on a lot of things. And you can do that with a buy. The other thing this Colts team does not have is like that mini buy where you play on Thursday night and then you get that weekend. You haven't had that. It's just been this kind of, you're playing 1 o'clock on Sunday, 1 o'clock on Sunday, 1 o'clock on Sunday. Okay, you get the night game against Minnesota. Every other game is 1 o'clock on Sunday. You're in a good routine, but when things aren't going well, sometimes the best thing you can get is a little bit of time off for players, for coaches, for, you know, to kind of just figure some stuff out. The Colts won't get that until like the first of December. Yeah. After the, after that game at new England in three weeks. How about that? You're right on that. I mean, ideally that would have been beautiful right after Halloween or right before. I will will say it doesn't always guarantee success. Sure. But the Chicago bears, they, mm -hmm. their offense was flying high after they played the Jags in London. (laughs) Right. They go into the bye week They don't score. I think they, they haven't scored in their last 23 possessions. And today they fight their offensive coordinators. So, It doesn't always work that way. It's not a guarantee, but sometimes it is nice to have that middle of the season. Okay, let's talk about this. With the, and and I preface this with having one of the premier running backs in the NFL behind him, uh, Joe Flacco, with with Jonathan Taylor. Concern over the last 10 games, these games, any concern at uh, five of those games? had over 200 yards. There were five that were under 200 yards. Are you concerned with this going out in the final seven games? And I, I preface this again. Let's say Jonathan Taylor is humming. Let's say he's running the football well the, like we know he can do. Are you concerned about that figure? I, I'm not concerned about the passing yards. I mm-hmm. am concerned about the rushing success rate. So what okay. does that mean? When you, when you hand the ball to Jonathan Taylor, does he gain, quote-unquote, a successful amount of yards given the down? So I believe on first down, it's four yards. On second down, it's you get within like third and two or third and three, and then third and fourth down, you gain all the yards you need to get a first down. And the Colts against Buffalo, you had JT pop that 58-yarder. You had a couple 10-yard runs in mm-hmm. there too, but I think the Colts' running success rate was around like 20%, where he just he got stuffed for no gain or a loss on seven of his 21 carries. That needs to come up. If you're going to hand the ball to Jonathan Taylor, you don't expect it to be a boom or bust thing. You expect it to be... You'll get the booms, but you're going to get efficient plays in between them and not going to get stuffed all the time. And that's what we've seen too much of lately with this Colts run game Mm -hmm. is, yeah, okay, that's great. You get a 58-yard run, 59-yard run, but you got to be able to churn out four yards if you hand it off on first and 10. If you hand it off on second and six, you got to get it into a third down distance where you can either run it or you can pass it. And we just, we've not got enough of that out of this Colts rushing offense. Well, lately. it's going to happen. Like we talked about strength of schedule. Hopefully that opens up some offensive alleyways. Uh, let's flip to the other side of the ball. 69%, the opposing quarterback's completion percentage. Is that a concern for you right now? Honestly, I'm not like really worried about that. I know it's frustrating to watch quarterbacks just kind of, you know. Like Sam Darnold. He right, had a, yeah, like one Sam of those Darnold, days. But yeah. You know what? If you're turning it over, I'm not, I, I don't have a big issue with that. If you're not giving up explosive plays, I don't have a big issue with that. Josh Allen hit a couple when he got outside the pocket. He made some stuff happen. That throw to Mac Hollins down the far side that was like no unreal. Special, yeah. unreal. When he threw that, I thought he was throwing it away. <laughs> and then he just drops it right into the bucket to Mac Hollins. Just like an incredible throw. The one he hit to Dawson Knox 
another incredible throw. So he, you're going to get some of those, but I think for the most part, this secondary has done a pretty good job keeping stuff in front of them and then getting the ball, you know, taking the ball away. So that to me, like the, the completion percentage, not something that I am super worried about with this defense. What I think I am a little worried you're, wait, about. Wait, 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 yeah. wait. You're worried if you don't get turnovers. Right. If this team consistently gets turnovers, it's an it's an okay balance of a trade-off, if I, you will. I think it's okay. I, I would like to see you get, th- this defense get a little better in the red zone. Mm-hmm. Based on that, they're 17th in the red zone, allowing a touchdown on 56% of opposing possessions inside the 20. You'd like to get that up a little bit higher if you're going to be a team that's going to allow a high completion percentage. But for right now, I think it's it's okay. This that's not like my like you know one a right worry about this team. I think my biggest worry about this defense is the third down defense. Go ahead, which could could flip into the completion percentage. But the Colts right now are twenty seventh in the NFL. They're allowing a third down conversion on forty four percent of opposing. Third What's downs. that rank again? Twenty seven. Twenty seventh. Mm-hmm. So that's not really where you want to be. No. Again, if you're if you're getting the if you're getting the turnovers, you can sometimes live with it. And if you're not allowing the explosives, you can sometimes live with it. But you want to be able to get off the field. You know, the offense has not done a good enough job maintaining possession. But sometimes the defense does need to just get off the field on third down to help that time of possession number. Stay there. I mean, stay there with the defense right there. Three and uh, the, the, the time. Where does time of possession all come into this, too? So make some sense of this as far as the three and out getting off the field like we're trying. That needs to go up. You just hit on that one thing uh, as far as three and out rate is 14.3%, second worst in the NFL. The time of possession comes into this because right now it's 32nd in the league, JJ, with yeah. a time of possession rate of 25 minutes and 55 seconds. So let's call it 26 minutes. It's a game that's worse in the NFL right now. Is that going to change? And also, when that changes, what's it? I guess what I'm asking is, what's the offense going to look like for this thing? Other than we're not going to look like the Chiefs offensively, but we got to have more time of possession. I mean, that goes into the efficiency stuff, right? With with Jonathan Taylor and the running backs and get you know churning out more efficient plays, but also that goes into the defense getting off the field, right? Where the the defense does need to do a better job getting off the field on third down. So I just looked it up. The last team to have an average time of possession under 26 minutes is the 2021 Seattle Seahawks. They went seven and ten that year. So, it you know, I, I, I this isn't a very rigorous statistical study, but you, you, it's got to come up, or you are going to finish right. with that it's seven gonna, and ten. It's yeah. really hard to win when you when you're only possessing it that much. And that Seahawks team had not not a similar offense, but I mean that was you know you're talking about like Russell Wilson, you mm-hmm. know, moon balls all over the place, just bombs away with that team. And I, I think the Colts. Can, can do a lot on both sides of the ball to just get that number up that will help you just be a little bit more sustainable in what you're able to do. Hey, we're going to paint a rosy picture for you. It's coming up, I'm telling you. But right now, it is the Tough Love segment. Follow him on Twitter, X, at JJ Stankovitz, and we're going with some rapid-fire stuff right now. Any concern with the Michael Pittman injury, not just missing last game, but the way that it's affecting this whole season? It's something that's nagging. Yeah, you, you want him to come back when whenever he does come back. You want him to be closer to the Michael Pittman Jr. we've seen over the last three years. And, I mean, it's, it's clear he's been dealing with something, and it's impacted his play because Pittman having one catch in consecutive games right. is not – that's not Michael Pittman. We know that. It, it's clear to everyone who's watching that that's not Michael Pittman Jr. So however long he needs to, to get back as – he's no one's 100%. At this point in the season, but to get to a point, it's a good point. Say that can, again. No one is 100. I mean, it's true, right? It's, I mean, there's not a player on that like, field. The that only is, thing that that I'm 100 percent about at the NFL at this point of the year is that no one's 100. percent Yeah, right. Because you're playing, you're, you're getting in a car crash every, every weekend, <laughs> yeah. and you can't be 100. percent Like I made that mistake once early in my career, where I went up to uh, it was a Notre Dame player who had just come back from an injury and he played a game, and it was like November. And I remember being like, oh, so like, you know, okay, you got to play. Are you back to 100%? He looks at me, he goes, no one's 100% right now. No one. Like, you can't be 100% can't. In a, no at way, this point right. in a football season. No shot. Hell, kickers even for that matter. I'm saying, no, you know, I mean, guy, even non-contact yeah. position guys right. are dinged so, up. The, but however, whatever level he needs to be at mm-hmm. to play like the Michael Pittman Jr. we've seen over the last three years, that's kind of a sneaky thing, too, that if this Colts offense were to be able to get that version of Michael Pittman back, that's a big boost for keeping yourself on the field because he's a great, you know, you need seven yards on third down. He's going to run eight yards to the sticks. He's going to make a tough catch and you're going to move the chains. 
That is a great skill that Michael Pittman Jr. has, and that's something that the Colts offense has missed a little bit. All right, let's talk about defense because statistics are coming all over the show today. 31st against the rush, 29th total defense. Will that come up in the next seven games? Uh, I'm not worried about the rush stuff. No? Really, no. Cause you, Tell okay, me why. Now, again, you're 31st that figure. against the rush, but that that is largely the product of uh, – hold on. No, see, I was in the wrong year. I was looking at this. I was like, why are we tenth in rush yards? <laughs> He's in the wrong. Uh, I'm year. in the wrong year. Okay, so you're you're 148 rushing yards per game. You're at 4.4 per. Mm-hmm. So that's 16th. So you're about. I think you're league average. The rushing yards per game are bumped up because of the first two weeks of the season, sure. which you have moved on from pretty definitively. And also, when you're losing, teams are going to run the ball more on you. They're going to rack up more rushing yards on you. So I'm not. Not that, overly concerned with that. Not concerned with the rushing yards per game. You'd like to get the rushing yards per play up a little bit more, but it has improved over the course of the season. It, you know, the, the big thing, though, for me, though, is the Colts are 25th in yards per play total, which, again, goes to, okay, quarterbacks are completing a lot of passes against you, but you, you've got to be able to kind of, on a more consistent basis, prevent those efficient plays on defense. And it's great if you're taking it away, which the Colts are doing, but if you can just kind of keep those takeaways up and then limit the efficiency of these opposing teams, you do have a defense that I think can, can do some really nice things down the stretch. You touched upon the defense. I, I Just another stat to throw out there. And it, it is a little bit of an eyebrow raise when you think about this. Over the course of these 10 games, they've been – on their average of being outgained is 67 yards. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I mean, that's an average of almost 70 yards a game, J.J. Is there any winning formula in there? And the only thing that I can come up with is, you know, this team starts going over the top every third play and they're scoring touchdowns, you know, every five minutes of the game would be the only way that that, that would stay down. Any concern with that by that 67 uh, average of more yards by the opponent than our Colts? Yeah, it's a good point. It, it's, you know... That leads to time of possession, right? Mm. Like, I think those two things are probably intertwined, where the opponents have had the ball for about 10 minutes more, 9, 10 minutes more per game. So, of course, they're going to get more yards. Like, if they were holding it for even, you know, and the time of possession is more balanced out, that's just fewer plays for the opposing offense and fewer yards. So those two things kind of, I think, are probably correlated a little bit. Okay, fair enough. I love it. J.J. Stankovitz on Twitter X, at J.J. Stankovitz for all the latest of the Colts, and Colts.com has you covered as well. we got a little bit of rapid fire right now about this Colts team. How about this one? The Colts have scored 20 points or fewer in five straight games. Is that a concern? By the way, that's the first since 1998 that this has mm-hmm. happened for a Colts team. Any concern there with the Shane Steichen offense? Yeah, I mean – You've played some good defenses, but that's not an excuse. Like, I think that the, those two things kind of exist independently of each other. Like, you've played some good defenses, but you've turned it over too much. Mm-hmm. And, and that goes into the eight, eight, tur- eight turnovers over the last three games, right? So you got to get the turnovers down. Now, look, the, the opposing defenses you're going to face down the stretch, they don't necessarily get easier. The, the teams and the records maybe get a little bit easier, but I'm just looking at this by EPA per play which is a a stat that I kind of like, just kind of looks at, you know, kind of all-encompassing. Denver is third in the NFL. Detroit is fifth in the NFL. Uh, You've got Tennessee at 13th. You have the Giants and Patriots are at 20 and 21. So the worst defense you play, and then Jacksonville at 31st. Where are the Jets in that whole thing? Oh, sorry, I forgot the New York Jets. Uh, (laughs) They're at 16th. 16th, middle Uh, of the road. They they took a bit of a hit against Arizona last week, but... The, you're you're still facing some good defenses. You're not. It's not getting easy, essentially. Mm. And also, I mean, the the thing that is maybe a little bit notable here over the course of this whole season is the only bottom ten defense by EPA per play the Colts have faced all year is the Jacksonville Jaguars. Wow, so Once. they're they're facing good defenses according they, to that. Every single defense, in fact, that the Colts have faced up to this point, besides the Jaguars. Look at this. Minnesota's one. Denver's three. Detroit's five. They haven't played them yet, but okay. Detroit's five. Bears are six. Steelers are seven. Texans are nine. Bills are 10. Packers are 11. Dolphins are 12. Titans are 13. Jets are 16. It's all pretty good, man. That's a, I mean, that's tough. Yeah. That is a, a gauntlet of defenses. The flip side is that the offenses that the Colts have faced are going to, the, the success of those that we've seen over the course of the season, that is going to go down. Dwindling, I like to say. Dwindling. Dwindling is a good way to put it. Yeah. So let, let's look at this over the next couple of weeks. 
The Jets are 17th. The Jaguars are 22nd. The Broncos are 23rd. The Giants are 24th. The Patriots are 25th. The Titans are 29th. So dwindling, dwindling. (laughs) Theoretically, the offenses you're facing Mm -hmm. are going to get a little bit easier, but the defenses are not necessarily going to get significantly easier. But still, I mentioned it earlier. Last year, three and five. This year, four and six. Sort of midway through. Gardner Minshew last year. This year, Joe Flacco. JJ, just tell me straight out. Like I said, you follow this team. When these guys are walking out of the locker room to when they're at their lockers, you know this football team and what needs to happen over the seven games. So it's put of a, a bit of a guess for you as well, mm-hmm. but is it five of seven that gets you in, in your opinion, from where you're sitting right now? You're ending up at nine and eight right there with that record, you know what I'm saying? And, mm-hmm. and, and obviously double digits. Woo, you're talking about a team that has to go six out of their next seven. But I say this with this team, and Colts fans are, are, are calling me and you crazy. It's a good team that can do this. It absolutely can go on a run right now with Shane Steichen. I know it doesn't feel like it right now, but this team, is as crazy as it sounds, could win the stinking AFC South still, the way it's put up I in mean, this thing. I know you need help from other teams. Yeah, you're, but you're three games back at Houston. Uh, sure, I, and I know it's right. a tough, a tall order like that, but we saw them win in the, the division last year out of yeah, the blue. Yeah, they went on a run, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I'm saying, J.J., it's, is it going to take five or seven? Is it going to take six or seven in your eyes? And, and like you said, this – strength of schedule rather is part you know efficiently down from the other teams that we play in uh earlier in the year is there a possibility for this i I think i think six of seven almost certainly gets you in based on your as long as one of those six is denver like whatever scenario it is as long as one of those wins is denver you're gonna have a shot if you if it's five if it's six the other team to keep an eye on here i mean cincinnati is going to be right there with their offense, with Joe Burrow clicking, with Jamar Chase putting up a zillion points. Shout out to Connor Handel, by the way. In Connor. Our office, in our office fantasy football league this week, he had Jamar Chase, and I still beat him. Nice. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Connor. Um, the the Bengals are going to be a tough one. The, I think I think Cincinnati, I know they just they, they keep losing these weird games, but they look like a team that could be primed for a run. Now, they go at the Chargers on Sunday Night Football this week, the game that was going to be Colts yeah, right. Jets. If they lose that, though, they might have to win out. <laughs> right. To make, I mean, so they, they, got, they got the Chargers. They got the Steelers twice. They still have the Broncos. Uh, they got the, you know, the Cowboys. Maybe they get Dak back by then. I don't know. Uh, so Cincinnati does not necessarily have an easy stretch, easy schedule down the stretch. Let's look at Denver. They've got, let's see, Atlanta. They've got Vegas and Cleveland. They've got the Colts. They've got the Chargers, Bengals, Chiefs to end the season. Whew. That's not easy. No. That is not easy. And two of those games are on the road. So now the Chiefs might sit their starters in that game unless they, you know, are trying to, well, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. They want the home field advantage, yeah. Yeah, they want home field. So I, I think, and, and, you know, don't count out Miami. They just won last night on, my, on a Monday Night Football. Good win. And they've got, the, they've got some, some winnable games down the stretch, but they're going to have to steal one, you know, at Green Bay, at Houston versus San Francisco in there to, to make a playoff run. But, you know, with two a back, you wouldn't put it past them. Uh, the, the, there isn't there is a path here, and here's what the so that's kind of setting the whole thing up for me to say I do think nine and eight could get the Colts in the playoffs, but the way it has to work out is one of those wins has to be over Denver. So if you win five of your last seven, one of them's got to be over Denver. One of those losses needs to be to Detroit, sure. Which Detroit's a really good football team, but the NFC doesn't count for tiebreakers Mm-mm. in this, and I think it could come down to your conference record tiebreaker. So if it, let's say your two losses somehow turn out to be Detroit and the New York Giants. Okay. And you win the rest of your games. That would mean that the Colts would finish with a, an 8-4 and four record against AFC opposition. That uh, Cincinnati could not do better than and that. And that gets them in at 9-8. That eight. gets them in at 9-8 because yeah. Cincinnati could not do better than that. And Denver could not do better than that. They could only tie that record. And then it would get into, I don't know what the, you know, beyond that, but... I think there's a really good chance that the Colts would get in. Absolutely. Eight. If they if their two losses are to the NFC teams that they play and they win out against the AFC, I think they're probably in the playoffs. Call me a homer, I don't care. I'm not speaking for JJ, but I No, can they, no, it's like can they do that is the next right. question. Call right. me a yeah. homer. Yes, this team can do that. This is a playoff push team that it starts midway through that they say, "Hey, something's going to click right here. Flacco in the offense and off we go." Okay, but you have to you have to start it at 1 and 1. I needed a Steve Kornacki board for that. Oh, boy, that would have been great. Next like, one we're going to yeah, do that up there. Right, yeah. Okay, this is fun. It, it starts at one at a time. I'm going to throw of our next opponents, you give me one player that 
that scares you the most on this roster? I think, mm. and my first question on that one is, are we catching the Jets at the right time or are we catching the Jets at a wrong time? Because they have been God awful, but Ooh. they do have so much talent over there, especially on the offensive side of the ball. That's a great question. Are you catching them at the right time or the wrong time? Right. Because they just got... Their oh. doors blown off by the Arizona Cardinals. Murray, look, six, yeah. Six points Whew. scored by former Colts practice squad great Spencer Schrader. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. So, hey, tip of the cap to Spencer. He was yeah. around here for uh-huh. a minute. Yeah. yeah. Uh, man, I don't know. That's a good question. They just, you know, they, they beat Houston. Yep. But that win over Houston is their only win since firing Robert Sala. Oof. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, some of these games have been close, you know, close loss to New England. For the most part, the. Close loss to Buffalo. They got blown out by Pittsburgh. They got blown out by Arizona. Um, now at home, they, they've definitely played better at home this year. Just kind of looking at this. They beat New England 24-3. to They lost by one to Denver, but they held Denver to nine points. They lost by three to the Bills at home. They beat the Texans at home. They haven't played a ton of home games this year. Yeah. So maybe that, that's a little bit of a difference there. To keep in mind, and the comfortability between Rodgers and, and and Adams is gonna we're, it's gonna flourish at some point. I, I figure he's only had less than a month on that football team. Devont, now. It, it, this is ugly. Devontae had thirteen targets, six catches, and thirty one yards against thirty one yards. Eesh. Thirteen targets and thirty one yards. Jeez. That no, is rough. No good. No that good. That is rough. Uh, the the guy who scares me the most for the Jets. Here we go for the New York Jets is Quinn and Williams. Okay, he can they're, wreck they're an offensive all line. All pro defensive tackle. Yeah. Um, with the Colts having some inexperienced guys, I think Tanner Borlini is playing really well mm-hmm. on the interior. Hey, but stay there for a second. Yeah. Where are we at with Bernie Ryman and Matt Gonsalves? And where we'll are we? See, we'll see on Bernie okay. this week, um, and we'll see. You know, if he, if he doesn't play, Gonsalves will be back in there. Good. Um, yeah, Quinn and Williams would be the guy who scares me the most on the New York Jets. Love it. A lot of people thought Aaron Rodgers was the guy. Obviously, it is. But let's go down to the Lions. Who scares you the most? Amon Ross St. Brown. Oh yeah, he can. He's, yeah. he's just going to get his. Right. He's such a crafty mm-hmm. football player. Um, a guy who, I mean, you know, I was watching that Sunday night game mm-hmm. and it's like, nothing's working for Detroit. You got Jared Goff throwing five picks right. and he, Amon Ra didn't have a huge game. He had six catches for 60 yards with a touchdown, but it's like when he's there, he's just all reliable and he's going to get you the yards you need to kind of continue some drives. Actually, I'm going to throw one other guy out there. Go ahead. It's Panay Sewell. Yeah. Oof. Weird to say an offensive lineman. No, but good one. Right tackle. You, you yeah. See what they do with him. <laughs> Like he he's is, athletic, isn't he? He is, he is one of the most athletic offensive linemen I've ever seen. It's like him and Trent Williams. Yeah, oh right. My right. God, what he's able to do on the edge with the creative stuff they're able to get to and the mentality he plays with. I'm going to throw him in there too. Good call. And, and by the way, they bucked up for him. They said, "Hey, you ain't getting away from this. You are here for a minute." So yeah, that's coming up. Lions, obviously, talked about St. Brown and uh, and Sewell. Let the Patriots. Who scares you Drake the most? May. Drake, Drake May's May. balling. Playing he's, good, he's right? Playing some good football. And by he's the way, got, I, that's on the road now. That is on the road. Drake May, you know, again, you, you look at the – you scout the box score, and you're mm-hmm. like, yeah, 15 to 25 for 184. Sure, he had four carries for 24 yards, but he's got a little, like, moxie to him mm-hmm. that I kind of like. It, it's kind of nice. Uh, I'll go Drake May there. He, he's, he's, got, he's got what it takes to, like, win some games that the Patriots shouldn't have any business winning, now for if that the, makes sense. Yeah, it does. For the next opponent, can I just, the exact same thing you said, just insert in, insert a different name in Bo Nix rather than in Drake May there? Yeah, I mean, Bo, Bo Nix, every week, you may look at it and you're like, oh, really? But 22 of 30, 215, two touchdowns for him against the Chiefs. Right there. And he doesn't turn the ball Should've over. Should have won the game. I'm going to go with Pat Sertan. Pat Sertan, on Denver, yeah. The, the lockdown cornerback they've got. Um, you know, I don't know if he, you know, we'll see if Michael Pittman's back for that game. But maybe he travels with Alec Pierce, and you just kind of try to take away the deep stuff. He is the he's that kind of you know Rick Venturi would call him an ambient player, the, yeah. the kind of guy who you need something to help you sleep at night when you're facing him. Love it. Okay, here we go, Titans. Who's giving you a scare? Probably Jeffrey Simmons. Mm-hmm. It's probably always Jeffrey Simmons. Sure. The same thing. Same thing with the interior. There. Um, I don't know. I mean, ten- Tennessee's got like their whole feels better than the sum like the the sum of their parts feels better than like the individuals mm-hmm. there but they are they're they are right there in contention for the number one overall pick this year they're at two and seven right now um you know but th- they're always going to play hard and they're always going to play hard against the colts and so the, yeah division game yeah. but take care of business down there that is down the road we're going over the rest of the schedule right now and some concerns on the roster as far as who scares jj stankovic at the giants that have not been playing good football yeah, and yet, I mean, this is going to sound like a uh, like a theme here that I'm just going to go with, you know, yet another defensive tackle. Give but, me it. Um, like, the, that New York Giants team, they are 
they are they go with Dexter Lawrence. Mm. The stuff he's able to do on the interior as not just a run stuffer, but he's like probably the best 300 plus pound pass rusher we've ever seen in the NFL. He is a an awesome football player that they have in the interior. So I'll, you know he he's the guy right there. And those guys can wreck offenses. Okay, finally Jacksonville. Where are they going right now? Mac Jones looks like could mm-hmm. be uh, playing the rest of the season. Don't know what's happening with Trevor Lawrence. I don't know what to do with Jacksonville <laughs> because they put up 37 points against the Colts. And you're going to sit here and like, I don't want to sit here and be like, I don't know who scares me on that team. It's probably Brian Thomas Jr. I mean, we saw him hit that 85 yard touchdown. He's a really talented football player. He's got, he's got like, you know, number one receiver type traits to him. Um, but boy, you get to that week 18 game, who knows what Jacksonville's going to be doing, what their record's going to be. If Doug Peterson's still going to be there, um, that, that's a long way out. But, yeah, I mean, Brian Thomas Jr., I think, to me, is the best player on that football team. All right, do me a favor. Close with this, all right? Let's close with this. Josh, Josh Hines Allen's pretty good, too. Yeah, not yeah. bad. He, yeah. He'll get after the quarterback. Close with this. Colts fans, some of them are on top of that ledge right now. Either talk them off the ledge or, J.J., if you want, push them right in. Okay, I, I, so here, here's, here's what we need to remember about the NFL. Mm-hmm. It's a weird league. It is a week-to-week league. You never know what's coming around the corner. Just... Don't lose hope yet because this team hasn't and there is still a pathway for this football team to do some good things this year. It may not look like it right now. It, and, and it, the last three games have been any indication this team is not a playoff contender, but that's three games. The three games prior to that were like, might win the division. Right. right. So let's, let's just take a breath. It's hard to do right now. See what happens in New York on Sunday. If you come out of that game with a win, Anything can happen. You might be right back in it. I love it. I like the chances, and I know it starts one at a time. I know Shane Steichen will have this offense rolling, and I like those teams that you go, boy, they were something. Jekyll and Hyde the first part of the year, but they came on. Texans last year could be thrown up as one of those teams. So, Colts fans, it starts one at a time. The New York Jets, 1 o'clock. Flex out of the primetime game. A little bit of slap in the face on both teams, JJ? Yeah, I mean, the Jets had been in primetime a lot, and – uh, that getting flexed out of prime time, I think, is much more to do with the New York Jets than it does the Indianapolis Colts. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, you know, the Colts didn't put on a very good performance in their one prime time performance this year. But if the Jets were good, that game would still be in prime time. Remember 2022? Mm-hmm. We played on Sunday night in Dallas. Yeah. And it's like, what are we doing on Sunday night football <laughs> that year? But it was because it was the Cowboys and they were good. Yeah. Same so thing. That, I, that, that's that's why it got flexed out. Understood. The, the, well, the three and seven Jets. I, you made me feel comfortable. I mean, thank you for that. I mean, I was up on the ledge. You didn't push me over. You talked me back like that because this playoff run is starting against the New York Jets, 1 o'clock, at J.J. Stankovitz on Twitter X, and, of course, at Colts.com. It's early in the week. You're going to be out on the practice field in a day. Find out what's going on. J.J., your thoughts this week? Uh, do we see a little bit of a, uh, a different sort of uh, energy, if you will, at practice after the things that went on with the a bad loss to Buffalo. Yeah, you hope so. Yeah. You hope that this team kind of has its back against the wall and uses it to their advantage. All right. Good deal. Hey, great stuff. Follow him on Twitter, X at JJ Stankovitz, and of course at Colts.com. Lara Overton will be back next year, Colts fans. It, next it, year. I, she'll be back next year, I promise you. Next, next week, week she'll be back next week, and we may even have JJ Kornacki on the whiteboard. <laughs> Who knows what's happening there? But all the information you need is at Colts.com. Don't forget, there's a watch party for the Colts Jets game going on downtown. At the back nine, if you are a Colts fan and want to hang out with other Colts fans, make your way down to back nine. More information is at Colts.com. For J.J. Stankovic, I'm Jeffrey Gorman. Appreciate the time, by the way. You were great. Fun pod. All right. We'll see you next week.